Adrenaline is very bad for decision making. So if you have one second to make a decision, say, and adrenaline is coursing through your body, it's almost like you're skipping microseconds because it's clouding your judgment. When you're cool and you're calm, you're Warren Moon, you're Kobe, LeBron, you're Michael, you know, whoever you are, you, you, you do not have this adrenaline rushing and time is slower because you have more microseconds available to you, even though it's literally the same amount of time, you're seeing more during that period of time. This is Entrepreneur's The Playbook, where I give you access each week to the world's greatest athletes and executives about their personal and professional playbook and what has made them champions on and off the field. This is The Playbook. This is Dave Meltzer, CEO of Sports One Marketing, here with Entrepreneur The Playbook. And we're going deep into science with John Brankus. We know him from sports science, but I want to start in a different area. Yep. Point of entry. Yes. We're going to get too many people ask me, and I, my viewers know this, but I ran Lee Steinberg, the big sports agency. Yep. Everybody wants to be a sports agent that can't be an athlete. Right. I think our careers are indicative of guys who love sports that probably weren't going to be seen on Sundays, right. um, <laughs> except for in the stands. But you know what is interesting is you and I both haven't limited our point of entry because what you did in particular was just go with your passion, your purpose, and created the skills, knowledge, and desire for a whole new area that, that now kids come to me going, I want to be like John, yeah. right? What's interesting is people always say, I want to do what you're doing. And I said, well, the road to do that is to figure out something else. Like do something original. Do something that someone hasn't done. Blaze your own trail. Sports science, when we created it, sports science was created back in 2006. It wasn't even a term in our lexicon. Right. Like there weren't sports science majors. There weren't departments. There weren't people on teams. <laughs> so, and in fact, when we created the name sports science, it was originally on Fox, they wanted to change the name because they're like, ah, nobody likes science. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Like people love it. Um, so yeah, the, I, my two passions in our production company, we had a sports division and a science division, and we literally married those two things together. First in a show called XMA Extreme Martial Arts, yep. Tom Cruise did the rap, rap sports, it was uh, rap doing with The Last Samurai. Then we did Fight Science, it was on National Geographic. Um, that was top 10 of all time for them. And then uh, Fox owned Geographic and Fox Sports, and they ran Fight Science opposite the original Peyton Manning, Eli Manning Sunday Night Football game. Fight Science was the third highest rated program of the year with no promotion. They're like, oh my God, people love this stuff. What else do you have? So I have sports science. I'm gonna bring in the world's greatest athletes, put them to the ultimate test. Um, you know, and we did, ended up going on, on ESPN. We were on 11 years, 1800 segments, six Emmys. Um, just things worked out that way, but you're right. You know, it was a different point of entry, but it was one that in a lot of ways has gone much longer than if I was a professional athlete and much deeper. Yeah, and you know, and so much. You're so much more fulfilled. It's interesting because I tell people, if you reverse engineered my career, there was no way you could do that other than the fact that I never limited my point of entry. I just kept on, I went from law school to technology, technology to phones, you know, CEO of Samsung, and then met Lee Steinberg. Point of entry is like, hey, can you run my company for me? But because of my skills, I'm like, I love sports, yeah. All the way to today where there's right. TV shows, podcasts, and all these other things that, were never really something that I thought were gonna be in my, in my I, if someone had given me my life today and said, this will be your life or you'll be an NFL running back, I would have said, nah, NFL running back, I have a better chance. Right. Because we keep this open, which leads to science. Because one of the things I love about what you do is I love science, I was always good at math and science, but I love quantum physics, metaphysics, physics, yeah. and I love the supernatural. Yep. And, okay. and I think, you know, whether you look through a telescope at the universe or a microscope, it's equally as fascinating to me. Yep. And what I see the sports, sport of science did is, okay, here's the subtleties of success. That's what I, what I thought of when I watched your show. Right. Here's the subtlety of success, 0.65 right. this, right. and you're like, no wonder the ball got past him, <laughs> right? Or no wonder he did this. Right. Or how, no wonder he's not warning track speed, right? right. I mean, power. Right. He hits the ball over the fence because right. it's this much of a difference. But there is an unknown, and you don't get to talk about it too much. And I think on your new show, and soul and science. On soul and science, we're going to get to what I find really, really interesting. And I think yeah. your audience is going to find it even where we take, okay, here's the physical, 
yeah. right? Newtonian physics, as you call it. Yeah. But why or how can this happen? And here's the soul part of it, the emotional aspect or the third eye or, and how, tell me a little bit more of how you're gonna get into the soul of science. So the, the soul is really the intangibles, the things that cannot be measured, that we currently don't have a way of measuring. We have heart and desire and leadership and all, all these sort of things that are extraordinarily important in sports. I love to point to Newtonian physics and say people fall in love with bigger, faster, stronger. But that's not necessarily the formula to be the best. You don't want to necessarily be the biggest, the fastest, or the strongest. If you take the top five running backs of all time take in the NFL, <laughs> right, you got the top five running backs in the NFL all time. None of them are over six feet tall. The average weight is 215 pounds. None of them have the fastest 40 in their class or on their team. Like they're big enough, strong enough, fast enough, but they're not at the top of the curve. So then, they, then you get into, so why, I call it the Goldilocks zone. In that Goldilocks zone, how do you rise to the top to be the best? And it's these intangible factors of having the audacity to believe that you can conquer as a 200 and some pound male, can conquer a 300 and something pound male, like that alpha chip, that, that, that intangible aspect to me taps into the quantum physics of it all of there, is, there are things that don't make sense to us in the Newtonian world that do occur, and I point to the principle of momentum. People always say, is momentum real? Getting seven base hits at the same time, you know, scoring, you know, scoring, uh, you know, like- Coming back from 32 points. Coming back from 32 points, you know, know, New England coming back against uh, Atlanta. Whatever it is, is it real? In the Newtonian world, theoretically, if you you are uh, performing an activity, the chances of success and failure are the same every time. They are not weighted based on what came when before. When you flip a coin, every time is 50% heads, 50% tails. How can it be 20 times heads sometimes? Right. And, and you would say it's 20 times head just by coincidence. But how, do you, how would you say that coincidence happens just at the right time? I think that momentum mm. is real. I don't think that I can scientifically prove it, but I know, and I think every fan knows, momentum is real because we witness it you know, all the time, every week, there's some game where a crazy series of events happens that you can't explain. So since we're talking science, one of the biggest aspects, most confusing aspects is time. Uh, In Newtonian sense, time is linear. It's a man-made construct, it's 24 hours. Right. But there's absolutely, in my mind, a multidimensional time zone that exists and, and exclusively exists in everyone's Mind. So if you're a quarterback, yep. like my business partner, Warren Moon, I believe time moves so much slower when he's going through his progressions and processing yep. that you, you can take his arm strength and the spin of the ball, which is perfect, by the way, from Warren Moon, and do your, the science part. But there's something special, a multidimensional time zone that certain athletes and business people, believe it or not, live in. How do you explain that or or can you give us some insight? Yeah, the commonality when we talk about time moving slower is elite athletes and elite people in their own fields do not have adrenaline coursing through their body. Adrenaline is very bad for decision making. So (laughs) if you have one second to make a decision, say, and adrenaline is coursing through your body, it's almost like you're skipping microseconds because it's clouding your judgment. When you're cool and you're calm, you're Warren Moon, you're Kobe, LeBron, you're Michael, you know, whoever you are, you, you, you do not have this adrenaline rushing. And time is slower because you have more microseconds available to you. Even though it's literally the same amount of time, you're seeing more during that period of time. And that's been, we've tested this with, uh, you know, uh, uh, men and women in the special forces. Like when you talk about not having your heart rate increase, uh, we put a uh, sniper in a box where we covered him with tarantulas, scorpions, cockroaches, everything you can imagine. Heart rate stayed exactly the same. So he put his ex-wife in there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it was like, oh. Exactly. <laughs> we He's like, like wait a minute. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so his, uh, you know, his heart, heart rate stayed the same and he was just as accurate. Now, if you put if you, if you put me in that box, right, I'm freaking out. Me too. That's why Just I'm not in the box. Athlete. You don't have to put anything right. else but the box. Exactly. <laughs> so that's really how you explain it in the Newtonian way. But I believe, I believe in what you're saying, that 
there is an, a, a dimension of time. When we talk about, this is what's crazy, you mentioned the paranormal. Yeah. The paranormal narrative, to me, is very 1950s, right? It seems very convenient. It's 1940s, 50s, right. it's very Buck Rogers-y. Like to say, black like, ah, oh, there's a- There's, <laughs> there's a, black and white TV. <laughs> yeah, it's a tin, tin can that flew through space and it went trillions of light years and it landed here and they forgot to turn out the lights. Like it just doesn't make sense. But if someone were to tell me, you know what, the universe is in any any way that you know you know of it, there actually are wormholes, and you could travel from one end to the other by you know the, yeah. sort of the the uh, you know Einstein experiment, folding a piece of paper and flying through like that. To me, you can't even mentally comprehend it, but it's a better narrative. It's like a like sure. oh, it's so advanced I can't understand it. I would buy into that more than a 1950s narrative. An another narrative that's interesting, and I. I was blessed to play college football somehow. And I believe that the reason, I didn't have the athletic skill to, to make it farther, but I, I believed I had a heightened awareness sure. that involved time, okay. but also, um, this may sound kooky, but I really want your opinion on it, a third eye, like a, a different aware. And I see, and I watch, I was a punt returner, a kick returner, a fairly good running back, but I felt my skill was I could, Actually, not, I couldn't see it in my mind. I just knew which way to go. And if you watch Barry Sam, there, there's several great running backs that you watch. You're like, they have a third eye. So here's, here's what I believe the third eye is. It's pattern recognition. Now, when you talked about when you know, Gladwell popularized the idea of the 10,000-hour rule, Erickson obviously originally came up with it, and he didn't mean literally 10,000 hours. And it doesn't mean 10,000 hours of practice. It means of deliberate practice. Now what deliberate practice does is it allows you to have the opportunity to discover a pattern. So when you look at the statistics of all the Super Bowls that have been won, usually, more often than not, the younger quarterback wins versus the older quarterback because that younger quarterback is probably someone who recognizes patterns faster. It doesn't really matter how many reps you have, it's just that you can recognize it faster. And that idea of the third eye is subconsciously, oh, I've seen this before. I know where to go because I'm recognizing that pattern. It's the same thing in music. Like brilliant musicians recognize patterns as to the one needs to lead to the four, to the five, to the one. Like that pattern recognition exists in every discipline. And through that pattern awareness of our senses, have you been able to reconcile the science, the physical science of somebody having better peripheral vision and better hearing and, and all of, because those are measurable. Absolutely. Combined with now, okay, because you have heightened senses, yep. you can recognize patterns if you're consistent about learning. And uh, so you, you measure that. My question I think I want to get to is I believe in consistency. Yep. And I believe that you know, cellular structure has a memory that then leads to neural pathways in your subconscious, 40,000 of those thoughts that actually can lead to a genetic or an energetic difference yep. in your DNA and electricity. How does consistency, all, both the soul of science as well as the actual science, yep. you're the expert, how, how does that consistency play into those patterns or just success in general for everybody, whether you're dieting, you're an athlete, or you're a business person. So think about this. People say, oh, I'm good at something. Uh, you know, I was injured, I came back, and I have great muscle memory. Muscle memory doesn't exist. Muscles do not have memory, but neural pathways do. So I, I like to use the, um, the analogy of the musician. Think of, it, think of someone playing the piano. There are no muscles in your fingers. It's just neural pathways, mm. right? And we're just pulling. We're like, we become the puppeteer. Now, that idea of becoming a puppeteer, like you can walk away from the piano, come back, and you still can do it. Your muscles are not remembering anything because there are no muscles involved. It's the neural pathways. It's the same, same thing in doing a business transaction or having the third eye. It's not a muscle memory. It's an, it's an intangible neural pathway that's exterior from your body that I've seen this before. I know how to do this before. I know how to adjust to this personality. I know how to hit that hole. I know there's a whole bunch of external patterns that are the same as the neural pathways that are burned. And I believe that you do emanate that, en that energy. How come when some people walk in the room, they just light up the room? What, what is it about that person, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they... 
Is it any one thing or is it just that their energy is so confident it, take, it affects everybody? Um, I think that another good analogy is if you think of chemistry that the outer ring of elements are unstable. When somebody walks in a room, they might be filling that outer ring and all of a sudden you light up and you feel, you feel something different. Well, I know you, Trent Dilfer, have soul of, soul and science. Soul of science. You're, you're in my realm now. I do a lot of business coaching. We have a TV show with Entrepreneur called Elevator Pitch, and I talk yep. about in 60 seconds in an elevator, the energy that you carry. I call it a 120 rule. Yep. I've actually gone outside of a room where I walked in and nobody notices me. People look right past me. Gone out, shifted my energy via meditation and breathing, and walked in and lit up the room. Right. And so actually making a science out of, that's my soul, right? My energy yep. uh, for, for me. Um, what one lesson or, or enlightenment do you really, because I, I love the show, right? right. I, I, can't, I can't wait. I will be promoting the heck out of you yeah, in the absolutely. show because it, it's what's needed. Right. But when you have these newcomers, we don't want to get too woo-woo. People would be, oh, wait, this is right. just BS because it's not. It's science. What's kind of your objective, you know, that first season of, okay, I'm going to acclimate people. And, and just to share a little, you, you told me earlier that originally people didn't think, uh, or the networks didn't really think that people would like science and sports combined. So I got excited because I think people generally would say, oh, what's the soul of science now? Right. This, right? They're going to dig it more. I know that. What's your objective of it? So with soul and science, you want to take the tangibles and intangibles and see how they work together. So this year um, on NFL Network, we did, we literally had, you know, one-on-one -on -one workouts just like with um, sports science. We had Sam Darnold and Josh Allen and Josh Rosen and all the big guys that were coming in and we're breaking them down and Trent and I are looking at, okay, this is the skill that makes them elite from just a physical aspect, but what about the intangibles of how they can command presence in a huddle, of how they can deal with pressure? Of, of pressure. Those sort of things is how we're introducing the audience to this idea of there are these intangibles that are I would argue more important than the actual tangibles because there are a lot of people who are big, fast, and strong, but people who are big enough, fast enough, strong enough, and have those intangible skills are really rare. All right, last question, winning. Winning. Give me your definition, knowing science, soul, and your great experience in life because you, right. you have got this fulfilled winner. Right. Define winning for me. I, th this is, I hope people don't think this is a lame answer, but I believe winning is honestly being able to say, I did my best. That's winning because the result of a game, especially a team sport, right? The result is out of your control. I mean, there's no way you can say, I'm going to win the Super Bowl, therefore I won. What if you played a really crappy game as a human being and you actually were on a team that won the Super Bowl? Did you do your best? Your team won, but did you win? To me, if you did your best and you can look at yourself in the mirror, that is the definition of winning and that's the score scorecard. Did I do my best? Usually every night when I pray morning, noon, and night, I say to myself, what can I do better? because I don't feel like I'm ever doing my best. I feel like I'm close, but I can always do better. I think you nailed it, John, because you are someone that enjoys the pursuit of your potential. Right. Right, and that potential is your best, and we, we never can reach it in the quantum sense, but you truly do enjoy the pursuit, and that's why you're having such great success. And you know, tell Trent as well, I said hi, and yep. we're here. I'm excited for the first season. Can't yeah, wait man. for the soul of science. It's Thank you awesome. so much for joining us. I got John Brinkus with Dave Meltzer here with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.